Okay, so next up we have Henrietta Schwartz, who is one of our very own. She's a graduate master's student from uh, Lund uh, Observatory. And it's actually a great pleasure then to welcome you back as an expert some years later to give a, a talk on these uh, topics. So Henrietta is currently a Morrison Fellow at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And Henrietta, once she has um, set up her computer, will tell us about ground-based high-resolution spectroscopy. Uh, and this is a powerful tool for characterizing exoplanets and their atmospheres. Thank you for the introduction. It is indeed a really, really special thing to be allowed back to uh, where it all started. Um, after I was here with my master's, I continued on to um, do a PhD in Leiden with Ignaz Snellen. And a lot of the work that you will be seeing uh, here today uh, was actually done during my PhD uh, in Leiden. So credit where credit is due. Uh, now in the last 20 years, uh, more than 4,000 exoplanets have been discovered and we have definitely entered an era of characterizing their atmospheres. This is a challenging endeavor uh, because you have this host star that is super, super, super bright right next to your planet. And this is a challenge, of course, we have both for the space-based telescopes and for the ground-based. But for the ground-based telescopes that I'm using, we have the extra challenge of looking through the Earth's atmosphere. So a lot of our work really is trying to make up for the fact that we have to look through the Earth's atmosphere. Um, now, we do it still because uh, you cannot do high-resolution spectroscopy from space, at least not currently. This also goes for the next generation of space telescopes. So in order to do high resolution spectroscopy, you need a lot of photons. You need a large collecting area. The more photons you have, the more you can spread out your photons into different wavelength bins, and the more precisely you can say something about what it is that you're looking at. So if we don't overcome this challenge, uh, we won't, and we need to do that even for small and cold planets, we won't be able to answer with certainty a lot of the questions that we have about exoplanets. High resolution spectroscopy is a powerful tool because you can go in and say unambiguously that you've detected a molecule. There is no doubt if you see that there is the molecule in the atmosphere at high resolution spectroscopy, you are seeing the fingerprint of that molecule or that atom. So that is incredibly powerful, but it, it's also incredibly difficult to do for exoplanets. Uh, I hope that I can convince you that it is worth uh, also looking at exoplanets from the ground with these large telescopes. And I think that what we'll see in the future is that space-based telescopes and ground-based telescopes and the people that work on the data sets, we will have to work together and make a joint analysis in order to really know what's going on and get the best of both worlds. Of course, ideally, what we want to do is push this, these methods that I will introduce you uh, for towards colder and smaller planets. And ideally, we want to end up detecting biosignature gases uh, around uh, on Earth-like planets. Uh, so that's where we hope to end up uh, with this. Um, I think I might actually be the first one showing this plot today, which is quite amazing. This is a, a typical plot to start with whenever you have an exoplanet talk. Uh, so just to remind us, there are a lot of different types of exoplanets out there. So we've got the distance uh, from the star and we've got the planetary masses. Um, now, currently, with high-resolution spectroscopy, we cannot look at all of these different types of planets. I'm just adding in Jupiter and Earth for reference. Uh, so the planets that we can actually take a look at currently are the very bright planets. So either we can take a look at hot Jupiters, uh, and it's not even enough that it's a hot Jupiter. It needs to be a hot Jupiter around a bright star. Uh, or we can look at uh, planets that are not bright because, they are, uh, because they're close to a star and receive a lot of irradiation from the star. Instead, they're bright because they're young. So the directly imaged planets, they're bright enough that you can take an image of them next to their uh, super bright star. Uh, and when you can do that, you can also characterize them with high resolution spectroscopy. So this is what we can currently do, and this is where we want to go. And uh, there is a long way down there, uh, but it should be possible to get there with the next generation of telescopes. So uh, I'll be talking about these three different uh, groups uh, of planets uh, in my talk. 
Uh, unfortunately, there won't be too much time to go into terrestrial planets because if I can't convince you that it works here and that will take me some time, uh, there's no way that you'll believe that it will work for terrestrial planets. Uh, but hopefully there'll be some more time to go into details during the discussion. So uh, I want to thank uh, Laura, of course, for uh, giving a very nice introduction to what it means to characterize exoplanets. That makes my job a lot easier. Uh, so all of the, most of the work that has been done in characterizing exoplanets has been for transiting planets. And there's a very, very good reason for this. Uh, transiting planets offer some unique uh, possibilities. Uh, so Laura has mentioned both transmission spectroscopy during the transit, secondary eclipses where uh, the planet light disappears behind the star so that you know what is the starlight uh, without the planet and that way you can look at the day side of the planet right before the eclipse and you have the face curves the full face curves that she showed us very beautifully an example of from uh, a super uh, hot ultra hot uh, jupiter uh, that is a very recent result um, so these are the options that you have for transiting planets. And we also look at transiting planets with high resolution spectroscopy. Uh, but a very nice thing that I'll show you is that we don't need to look at high resolution, uh, sorry, at transiting planets. We can also characterize non-transiting planet with high resolution spectroscopy. So that gives us a few more targets, which is good seeing as we don't have that many targets as it is to begin with. Um, of course, most observations are made from space so that you don't have to deal with the annoying atmosphere of the Earth. And space offers high stability, but you do have a low spectra resolution. So how does it work with the high resolution uh, spectroscopy? Well, the uh, basic idea is that you um, treat the star and the planet like it's a spectroscopic binary. You just have that the planet uh, taking the role of one of the stars is a lot fainter, but you're treating it like a spectroscopic binary. So you take a time series of spectra. So this over here is a toy model. So you've got wavelength along the x-axis and you've got time or orbital phase up along the y-axis. So imagine that each row is a spectrum and you stack these spectra on top of each other. Now, the Earth's atmosphere, the lines that are originating in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, they're quasi-stationary during your five or six hours of observation. So that means they're going to be vertical. The star might have a little bit of a wobble because, as we've seen earlier today, you can detect the presence of planets from the radial velocity uh, changes of the star but the star changes its radial velocity on the order of meters per second, perhaps, whereas the planet that is orbiting the star, and especially in the case of a hot Jupiter, where it's orbiting very fast in a short period, uh, that will change its radial velocity, for instance, during a transit with tens of kilometers per second. So it's a very large change in the radial velocity of the planet. So what we can go in and detect with high resolution spectroscopy is this changing radial velocity. It's not just that it's a large radial velocity, it's that it's changing. Uh, because these white lines here are meant to be exaggerated planet lines. And you can see how the planet lines have this radial velocity curve um, that we can follow. So we can either, if it's a transiting planet, we can do transmission spectroscopy and we can see this change during the transit. Or we can look at the day side before or after the secondary eclipse. And like I said, we don't actually need the secondary eclipse in order to separate what is stellar light and what is planetary light because we're using uh, that there is a slope in the planetary lines over the time series. So that means that we can also do this for the non-transiting case. Uh, so it's the slope of these lines, the planetary lines, where the telluric lines and the stellar lines are vertical. This is what allows us to filter the two things from each other. Now what you see up here is a small portion of real data. So this is a time series of spectra. All the dark stuff here is all telluric lines. There are basically no stellar lines uh, at this wavelength range for this star. So it's 
all lines originating in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and then I've injected a strong fake planet signal that is still not strong enough to show up up here. Uh, but when you remove the telluric light, you can see these fake planet lines and you can see here how they're tilted. And this is what has allowed me to remove the telluric lines because I can treat it on a column per column basis. So you can do something like a principal component analysis, for instance, to remove the trend in time for each of these columns. And that will not affect the planet signal because the planet signal doesn't fall on a single column. It is tilted. So this is the, uh, the magic uh, that happens. Um, but how does that work when the individual planet lines are too weak to be seen? Uh, well, in that case, you need to combine the signal from all of your planet lines. So let's say you've got 30 strong carbon monoxide lines in your wavelength range. You need to combine the signal from all of them in order to get a detection out of it. So the way you do that is through uh, having a model spectrum and it does not need to be complicated. The only thing at this point that's important is that the line position needs to be correct. So you need to know very precisely the line positions, which you do for a simple molecule like carbon monoxide. Uh, and then you cross correlate it with each row. So you still have that this is a time series and each spectrum, each row is cross correlated with the model. Uh, and just in case um, that uh, some of you are unfamiliar with uh, cross-correlation and autocorrelation functions, this is an example of an autocorrelation function. So you've got uh, two uh, models that are exactly the same, and you check for a lot of different Doppler shifts. How similar are these two models? And once you get to the exact right radial velocity, you're gonna get a nice, strong, big cross-correlation signal. So this is how, uh, how it works. So of course, when we're doing this for the observed spectra, what you have is, imagine the black one is instead just a lot of noise, but there are some hidden lines in there. And then you're just matching at what radial velocity is there a peak? At what radial velocity is it saying that these are very similar here? Of course, they're never going to be as similar as an autocorrelation function where you get the value of one when they match completely. So let's look how that works. So now you have, again, time up along uh, the axis. So you've cross-correlated your model with each row uh, in here, and that gives you a radial velocity, uh, the radial velocity shift of the model. And here you see the peaks. And this is, again, a fake signal, so it's nice and strong at this point. Uh, but that will give you uh, this nice slope that you're looking for. Now, the first time that this uh, was done uh, was carbon monoxide in uh, transmission spectroscopy of HD 209458b. This is one of the planets that has been uh, receiving a lot of characterization work. It's got a nice bright host uh, star, so we all like it very much. And here you can see this tilt. So this is, uh, this is the cross-correlation matrix. So each row is a cross-correlation function between the model and the observed noisy, noisy, noisy spectrum containing the planet lines hidden in that noise. And you, you see this nice strong signal come out. It's not very obvious, but you can see we've checked what did we expect. We did expect exactly the slope that we got out. And of course, we knew which slope we expected for this planet because this planet is a transiting planet. So we knew its orbit. Now, what if at that point your signal is still too weak, so you're not seeing a slope in your cross-correlation matrix? Because day side, uh, sorry, um, transmission spectroscopy gives you relatively strong signals, but if you want to look at the day side of uh, a hot Jupiter, you're expecting a weaker signal. So uh, you might not see a strong signal here. And if it's not a transiting planet, you also don't know the orbit, so you don't know what slope to expect. So what you do is you say, OK, I don't care that I don't know the slope. I will just try all the different slopes. And uh, you can also try a lot of different systemic velocities. So the systemic velocity uh, is just the radial velocity of the star, of the system, relative to our sun. Uh, and the radial velocity amplitude, you can see here, uh, you've got 
uh, the radial velocity curve of the planet. So here you've, it's just the sinus function and you've got the radial velocity amplitude. So you can try out a ton of different ones of these and that corresponds to basically taking this slope and is making it vertical. And once it's vertical, you can collapse it into a, you can just co-add it so that you end up with a single signal. And you can try out this for a lot of different KP values and a lot of different VSIS and see if any of it makes a signal pop out. So this is how that looks when you've done it. So you can see you've got the uh, radial velocity amplitude, KP, up along the y-axis on all of these. And you've got the systemic velocities that we've tested along the x-axis. Uh, and some of these are transiting, some of these are non-transiting. So if there is a vertical, um, sorry, if there's a horizontal line, it means that it's a transiting planet. Uh, so we know which radial velocity amplitude to expect. And in all cases, do we know which systemic velocity to expect? Uh, and then we can see, is there a signal where we expect there to be a signal? Yes, there is. Okay, so it's a new planet we've detected. It was the one we were looking for, and we have found a molecule in its atmosphere. So the red ones here, they're all observed at 2.3 microns, uh, and it's uh, carbon monoxide that's been detected in all of them. In some of them, we've also detected a bit of water, so this signal got stronger when we added water to our model rather than just having a simple model only with carbon monoxide. Uh, and these two down here uh, have been observed at 3.2 microns, uh, and here it is water that has been detected. So different uh, wavelength ranges will also tend to uh, be more sensitive to different molecules. I should mention that all of these have been observed with the Cryer spectrograph at uh, the Very Large Telescope. Uh, but there has also been uh, separate confirmations of several of these uh, using near spec uh, at Keck. Uh, so, uh, for instance, both water in the L band and also um, I think this one, no wait, Taubotus has also had carbon monoxide in, uh, in the K band detected with, uh, with Keck. So it's nice that different telescopes uh, agree on these things. So those were all the ones I just showed you. These are all day side uh, spectroscopy. Uh, but I also said that transmission spectroscopy actually gives you stronger signals. So that, of course, you can only do if the planet is transiting. Uh, and the one that's been studied the most is HD 189733b. Uh, so here uh, you have that several different molecules are searched for, and you can see there is no detection of methane and CO2, but there is a detection of CO and water. Uh, now, what's really nice is that you can do a little bit more when it's uh, transmission spectroscopy because it turns out that the cross-correlation function is sensitive to the average shape of the line profiles. So if your individual spectral lines, if they have a shape, that shape will translate over to the shape of your cross-correlation function and represent the average uh, spectral line shape. So if you have, for instance, rotational broadening of your spectral line, if the uh, planet is rotating, that will give you a broadening of your spectral lines and that will give you a broadening of the cross-correlation function. Because this is a hot Jupiter, it's uh, quite likely that uh, it's uh, uh, in synchronous rotation, so it's got one side of its planet of the planet facing the star at all times. That's going to be a really hot day side, and then a cold night side on the other side. Uh, and what you see here is that um, the rotational velocity uh, can be determined, uh, and it's a little uncertain exactly where it is, but it is consistent uh, with synchronous rotation. Uh, so that is what we expected, so that's nice. The other thing that's uh, been detected is that the, um, 
equatorial super rotation down here. So what that is, is that when you've got a hot day side that's permanently facing the star, and you've got a cold night side, you're gonna have that there's hot winds streaming from the day side towards the, the night side. So this is called equatorial super rotation. So that basically means, if we go back here, uh, that you might expect that there's a little bit of a shift relative to the radial velocity measured of the star, because you have that there is, uh, you know, um, hot uh, air streaming from the hot day side to the night side. So what you're seeing here is that there is weak evidence that there is a little bit, maybe about one kilometers per second wind going from the day side to the night side. And this has also been seen in the optical. Uh, the HARP spectrograph has been used to detect sodium lines in the same planet during a transit. And they also saw uh, that there was this blue shift uh, because of equatorial super rotation. Now, um, you can also say something about the vertical temperature structure of uh, the planet. So this is only true when you're looking at the day side, not during transit spectroscopy. So when you're looking at the day side of the planet, you've got a line of sight going straight deep into the planet, as deep as you can go, uh, where it gets optically thick, and then the light comes back out. Right? And you're looking at the day side in the infrared. So you're not looking at reflected light, you're looking at thermal light because these are hot planets. So you're looking at uh, the radiation coming out from the planet because it is hot. Now, uh, you will always have that your spectral lines are formed in different altitudes of the atmosphere. So the wings of a spectral line, uh, the continuum comes from deepest down in the planet, as deep down as you can see. Then the wings come from a little bit above that. And the narrow core of your spectral lines come from high up in the atmosphere. So if you've got a big temperature gradient, you're also going to get a strong absorption signal. So what you see here is a carbon monoxide model, uh, absorption model, that can come from a temperature pressure profile like this, where you've got that uh, the temperature drops as you go up to higher altitude. So high altitude is upwards in these plots. Uh, and that gives you nice, strong absorption lines. So these little ones here in the middle are just to zoom in on one of the strong lines. Now, you can also have a temperature inversion, as uh, Laura was saying, where you've got that there's a stratosphere where the temperature increases with increasing altitude. Now, that will give you emission lines instead. Uh, and that means that if you cross-correlate with an absorption model and you see uh, that you're not getting correlation, you're getting anti-correlation, well, then you've got emission instead of absorption. Uh, of course, you can also have more complex temperature pressure profiles. That will give you more complex line profiles. And the dashed line here is um, the model convolved to the spectral resolution of uh, your spectrograph. Cryris has a resolving power of 100,000, which is as high as it currently gets for near-infrared uh, spectrographs. And even at that very high spectral resolution, you still get that if you've got a complex line profile, it starts to get a little tricky to see what's going on at that spectral resolution. Now let's see at the results. So this is the same planet that Laura was showing you, HD 209458b. So when she was talking about temperature inversions, she was showing you how first we thought there was a temperature inversion in this planet, but then through space-based low-resolution spectroscopy, they managed to say, nope, nope, we, were, we got it wrong the first time. The new analysis is showing something different. Simultaneously, we uh, used Cryrus to show it in uh, the same thing, basically, with high-resolution spectroscopy, because we could rule out that there was a strong temperature inversion uh, happening relatively deep in the atmosphere. Now, with um, high-resolution spectroscopy, we're also sensitive to a little bit higher up in the atmosphere, so we were hoping that we could extend it a little bit, and indeed we could. We could put, we could extend the pressure ranges where we could rule out an inversion layer a little bit higher up in the atmosphere, uh, because we're more sensitive to higher up in the atmosphere than at lower resolution. 
But you can also see that at this point, uh, we could not see the difference between weak inversion high up in the atmosphere, broad absorption and narrow absorption. It all gave rise to a weak cross correlation signal. Now, one solution uh, that I've already hinted towards uh, of how we're going to solve these kinds of problems is that we need to work together. So there's been two attempts so far at combining uh, low and high resolution, and both of them are very recent. This is one of them. The other one is in uh, for optical uh, transmission spectroscopy. So this is uh, transmission spectroscopy of... Um, no, sorry, this is the day side... Um, this is the same data that I just showed you. Uh, so the day side of HD209. Uh, uh, and you've got the spectrum up here uh, in, in the red, and it's, it's very, very noisy. Uh, so, no, sorry, these are the models. And then you've got down here uh, the low resolution data. There's Hubble data and there's Spitzer data. So uh, the big question is, how do you combine these two in a good way? Now, if you've got low resolution spectroscopy from space, the way that you say something about the atmosphere, like the TP profile or the abundances of molecules, is that you do a full atmospheric retrieval uh, in an MCMC code. Uh, you can't do that for high resolution spectroscopy because it would take years. Uh, there's simply uh, too many points. It's currently not possible. Uh, so instead what they did was that they uh, used the analysis from the low dispersion spectro spectroscopy and they used that as the starting point for doing a full atmospheric retrieval of the high resolution. So they basically said, now that we've done this analysis, what do, what do, uh, which models are still possible if we also put in the constraints from the high dispersion spectroscopy. So it's sort of a way of getting around. It is not the optimal way. We would like to do a full, at the same time, joint analysis. Uh, but for now, this is the best we've managed to do. And then you can go in and constrain the temperature pressure profile better than when you just had the low resolution uh, things. Also down here, uh, you have the, the gray ones in the background uh, are the posteriors uh, for the different molecules based on low dispersion spectroscopy alone. And the black ones are the ones you get when you add in the constraints from the high dispersion spectroscopy. Uh, another thing that we would like to do is uh, more different wavelength ranges. So currently with... Uh, Cryers, uh, well, currently Cryers is being upgraded, so it's not on the telescope, and it hasn't been for a few years, unfortunately. Um, but in, in its current uh, settings, or the settings it used to be in, it has a very, very small wavelength range. So you can only look at these wavelengths at a time, and then you have to move it and obtain it at a different one. Uh, and it will get a lot better after the upgrade, uh, but it will still be a very narrow wavelength range compared to anything you can do from space. So uh, you want to select your wavelength range carefully. So uh, Remco de Kock, uh and myself and others, we took a look at different wavelength range and how strong a signal you should expect for the case of HD 189733B at different wavelength ranges. And what we found was that 3.5 microns might be a sweet spot because there are several carbon and oxygen bearing molecules that are all uh, giving rise to a strong signal. Now, it's not going to be uncomplicated because there's more uh, contamination from the Earth's atmosphere at 3.5 microns than there is at 2.3 microns. Already when we went into the L band and did the water detections at 3.2 microns, there was more uh, atmospheric contamination but it's possible to mask it out. So that has been taken into account here, and we still think that 3.5 microns is going to allow us to simultaneously detect uh, methane, carbon dioxide, and water. So these are the major carbon and oxygen-bearing molecules uh, that are present at 3.5 microns, and they can all be detected in one go. This is important because with high-resolution spectroscopy, it is very, very difficult to do abundances. So you can say the molecule is present. There is no doubt it has carbon monoxide, but you can't 
easily see how much carbon monoxide it has. But if you have several different molecules, then you can see, well, how much methane does it have relative to carbon dioxide? And if you've got all the major carbon and oxygen bearing molecules, then you can say something about the carbon to oxygen ratio. And that is important, especially if you care about formation, because there might be some links to where in the planet, so where in, in the circumstellar disk that the planet was formed, and then what carbon to oxygen ratio it ends up with. It is uh, not a, a given. We don't yet know the exact answer for if it has this ratio, it definitely means it was formed here. Uh, but it's something that people are working towards in the astrochemistry departments around the world. How can we figure out connecting carbon to oxygen ratios to where it was formed in the disk? Another very recent uh, paper, this paper uh, is still only a preprint, so it's out on archive. Uh, is uh, this is exciting not because anything new was detected but because it was done with a much smaller telescope. So VLT is an 8 meter, Keck is a 10 meter, this is a 3.5 meter uh, telescope but it's a very good very new uh, spectrograph. So this means maybe we don't always need the best telescope in the world. If the spectrograph is, is really good you can still do things. And what makes Giano special is that it has a long simultaneous wavelength range. So you don't get uh, as um, many photons to play with, but you have a lot of spectral lines. And remember how I said that we're collecting the signal from all of the lines in your wavelength range. So it makes a difference if you've got 10 lines or if you've got 100. So these are uh, what I've been talking about so far. Uh, that's all hot Jupiters. So I want to point out the differences between observing a hot Jupiter with high resolution spectroscopy and a young wide orbit giant that, be, that has been detected through directly, uh, direct imaging. So here you're either looking at transmission spectra or you're looking at thermal emission from the day side. You have no spatial separation from the host, so this is the equivalent of a spectroscopic binary. And what allows you to do something is that you've got fast orbital motion and even more important, you've got a changing Doppler shift of the planetary lines. So this uh, requires you to observe for a lot of hours and you're using this time differential to filter the light from the stars. You've got spectral filtering, of course, and then you've got temporal filtering. Now, if you're instead looking at a young wide orbit giant, uh, you now have slow orbital motion and a constant radial velocity shift relative to the host, and this constant radial velocity shift might actually be quite small, uh, but instead you have spatial separation from the host. So this is the equivalent of a visual binary, uh, and you can do spatial filtering along with your spectral filtering. So you still need two different filtering techniques, uh, but you can use a different one. The reason why we want to combine uh, high resolution spectroscopy and high contrast imaging is actually very simple. If we look at high dispersion spectroscopy alone, uh, this uh, is a simulation of an 8 meter telescope, so something similar to the VLT. You've got a seeing at 0.6 arc seconds, and this is the typical contrast ratio that we can achieve. 10 to the minus 4. This can perhaps be pushed to 10 to the minus 5. It has in some cases. Now, high contrast imaging, on the other hand, uh, you're using, for instance, uh, or what I'll be showing you is just adaptive optics, but good adaptive optics. So there, what you're doing with adaptive optics is that you're um, suppressing your starlight. So you're concentrating your starlight uh, by um, changing the surface of the mirror so that all the distortions happening up in the atmosphere are being corrected by these changes in the mirror so that you end up with a plane wavefront. And what this does in practice is that it uh, concentrates the stellar light in a much smaller area. So if the planet is uh, separated uh, by an angular distance from the star, your starlight is suppressed at the planet position. So instead of having that the starlight is up here, it's been suppressed. And here you've got a separation of, let's see, that's like 0.6 arc seconds from the star in this example. Uh, you've got a strail ratio of 0.3, and this gives you a contrast ratio of 10 to the minus 3. Now what happens if we can combine the two, if we can make use of this uh, good adaptive optics 
and separate them visually but also uh, have high dispersion spectroscopy, well then we get a contrast ratio of 10 to the minus 7 all of a sudden, which couldn't be achieved with high dispersion spectroscopy alone, nor could it be achieved with high contrast imaging alone. So we're definitely very interested in trying to combine them. Uh, and let's see how that works in practice. So first you have a planet that's been detected via direct imaging. So there's an example over here. This is GQ Looper A, the star, and this is GQ Looper B, the planet. So it's possible with photometry to take an image where they're separate. Now you already know where the planet is. So uh, Cryris has a long slit spectrograph, so a thin slit, but you can place the slit so that both the star and the planet are within the slit at the same time. So now what you have here, this is not a time series. This is the slit position, and this is the wavelength. This is the dispersion direction. And the only thing you can see is the spectrum of the star. So you've got the spectrum of the star running here, and here where I've placed the B is the spectrum of the planet. You just can't see it because it's embedded in the stellar PSF, in the stellar point spread function. So it's hidden, but it's in there. So if we can just remove the stellar light, we can extract the planetary spectrum. Luckily, we know exactly what the stellar spectrum looks like at that exact moment because we've observed it. So we can use the observation of the stellar spectrum to both correct for the telluric lines because they're in the stellar spectrum and to correct for uh, the tilt of the spectrum in this observation for how it changes over time in flux level. All of this information is already encoded in the simultaneous observation of the stellar spectrum. So uh, we extract the spectrum for each and every slit position. So that's what you see here, is that we pretend that uh, there is a spectrum at every slit position, and then we extract it using the information of how we would extract the stellar spectrum, and then adjusting for the PSF uh, as we move in this uh, in the slit direction. And then once we've done that, all we have to do is remove the stellar spectrum that has the telluric lines in it, uh, and we're left uh, with a lot of noise. And hidden in this photon noise, there's a planetary spectrum. So in order to find it, we of course cross-correlate with our model again. So we cross-correlate each of these noisy, noisy spectra that contains nothing but noise with our model, and at one of these positions along the slit, there is also something more than the noise, there's also your planet spectrum. So once again, you get a nice signal. So this is still the slit direction, and this is now the radial velocity. And you can see it pops up. And this is a nice strong signal uh, to noise of 12, so this is much stronger signals than what we were looking at for day side spectroscopy of hot Jupiters. Um, this is 45 minutes of observations. We detect uh, carbon monoxide, we detect water, this is both at 2.3 microns, and when we have a model that contains both of them, uh, we get a stronger signal just like you would expect, so that's very nice. We can even look at the spectrum directly, so this is the extracted planet spectrum for GQ Looper B, uh, and you can see how noisy it is, but you can also see I've overplotted a carbon monoxide model in red, and you can see the strongest of the carbon monoxide lines in the spectrum. So uh, there's no doubt about what you're looking at right here. But there's more information we can get out of this. Um, First of all, what we have down here is Beta Pictoris. Uh, so let's see what are some of the differences that we can see. First of all, you can see that the signals are shifted relative to the stellar velocity. And also, uh, you can see that uh, one is narrow and one is broad. So when they're shifted relative to the stellar velocity, uh, remember this is not transmission spectroscopy, so this is not an overall blue shift of a day side to a night side. This is the actual orbital radial velocity of the planet that you're seeing. Uh, and it's relatively constant, uh, at least over the time of the observations, because you're looking at a planet that's far away from its star. Beta Pictoris is about 9 AU uh, from its star, and GQ Looper B is about 100, times, 100 AU, so 100 times further out than the Earth is from the Sun. Uh, what you can use the radial velocity to is uh, help constrain the orbit. So even a single radial velocity measurement is really, really powerful uh, when it comes to constraining the orbit of these things. What you have on the left is uh, a bunch of simulations with um, LSMSC, 
uh, from based on astrometry alone. So based on astrometry of GQ loop B, these are the best fit orbits. You've got the eccentricity, the inclination, and the semi-major axis. Now, with, if you add the constraint of the single radial velocity measurement, you can rule out a bunch of these orbits. So you can rule out, for instance, the circular ones and the very long period ones, with the exception of the very unlikely <laughs> but very eccentric orbits out here. So uh, this is super powerful. Unfortunately, you can't do any better than this for the next 30 years because uh, GQ loop B is 100 AU from its star. It's not going to change its radial velocity for about 30 years. It's also not going to change in astrometry uh, how it's moving the proper motion in the next 30 years. So we have to be patient for this particular one. But for Beta Pictoris, the constraints have been much tighter with the orbit in a collaboration between radial velocity and astrometry. So um, that is very helpful to people that are working on dynamics and dynamical evolution. The other thing, as I mentioned, is that one signal was broad and the other one was narrow. So this is because of the rotational broadening that I was talking about before. So you're no longer dealing with a close-in planet that is in synchronous uh, rotation, you're dealing with a planet that's far away from its star and it can be rotating in all sorts of different, uh, with all sorts of different rotation rates. So Beta Pictoris is a fast rotator, 25 kilometers per second. GQ loop B uh, is a slow rotator at 5.3 kilometers per second. Now we've done a few more, so these last two are, are not published yet, but they will be very soon. Uh, we have one at 12 kilometers per second, and we have one at 21.5 kilometers per second. So we're seeing a lot of variation in the V sine i's, uh, which is interesting because that means we can start to wonder what it all means. Uh, so the three parameters that I think are the most important ones uh, when it comes to discussing the uh, rotation rates of uh, these wide orbit planets is how far away is it from its star? So you can see those numbers here. What is the age of the system? And how massive is the planet? Unfortunately, the masses are always very uncertain uh, until we get a better idea of their orbit. Uh, but you can generally, and the ages are also to some degree quite uncertain, but we should be able to count on this is a, a younger system than these two systems. This is the older system. So the relative ages and the relative masses should hold up because it's similar methods that have been used uh, for determining the masses and the ages. So let's go through these three parameters one by one. Uh, now in the solar system, we have that more massive planets uh, they spin faster, they rotate faster than less massive planets. It's not quite as simple as that, of course, because, for instance, for the Earth, you have a very massive moon that slowed us down a little bit. Uh, if you have uh, a planet like Mercury and Venus, uh, it's too close to the sun, so that is what is dominating the rotation. But if you're looking at the very giant planets very far away from the star, you do uh, expect them to be unaffected by uh, tidal effects. So they should have retained the rotation they have since very early on in the formation or uh, early uh, dynamical evolution. Uh, this is not very well understood. Why do we have that the spin angular momentum is roughly proportional to the masses squared? It's very controversial and, and there is no physical uh, good reason why this is the case. Uh, but it's still interesting. Uh, the best I've heard when it comes to an explanation was that uh, if you have um, a core accretion scenario, uh, you're accreting material, uh, and um, as you reach, as, as you get close to a certain fraction of the escape velocity, the accretion gets inefficient so that uh, the final spin rate is related to how much mass was originally available when, when it started accreting. Uh, but like I said, it is quite controversial. All the same, we can plot my uh, planets here and we can see that they do not obviously fall on this trend. Uh, you have um, that some of them might, some of them might not, but this is actually completely to be expected. The solar system is mature. It's been around for a while, uh, and I'm looking at very, very young planets. Uh, so it might be relevant to spin them up a little bit. 
This is a new paper that's out on archive. Uh, it has not been accepted yet. Uh, but what you have here is the solar system planets, their rotation, their masses. Then you have um, some brown dwarfs that are all from the star-forming region of Taurus, which is the same star-forming region that G.Q. Lupa is from. And G.Q. Lupa was the youngest of our planets at about one mega year. Uh, and what he's done here is that he has spun them up. He said, right now they're young and bloated, but they're going to contract and spin up. Uh, and once they spin up, they're actually going to fall pretty close to the relation that we're seeing in the solar system. This is GQ Lupa down here. He's also spun up GQ Lupa, and it still falls well below uh, this uh, relation, this empirical relation that we're seeing. Uh, so why is that? Well, GQ Lupa is still actively accreting. There are several different uh, forms of observational evidence pointing towards that it's still actively accreting. So let's imagine that at the very youngest ages, uh, a planet's uh, spin rate, a planet's uh, spin uh, evolution, if you will, is going to be dominated more by the age than by the mass. So you can have a planet that's so young that it's still accreting. You can have a planet that's in the contracting phase. And only once that steadies off are you going to find something that actually lands on this relation. So let's see how that fits uh, the data. Uh, so I mean, it's, there's way too few points to actually do statistics on this. Uh, but I mean, we certainly uh, are seeing something that could look like what you might expect if you have that GQ Lupa down here is still accreting and these are all contracting. But a difference. So this is the oldest. And here you have these. Now, interesting enough, uh, these two are in the same star forming region. So we know that these have the same ages, but they have very different masses. And this is the more massive one. So it's quite likely that how they contract uh, is closely related to what mass they have, because we do know that their radius is very dependent on the mass. So you can imagine if there is conservation of angular momentum that you will also have that how they spin up relates to their mass. Because if you have a lot of deuterium burning, that is going to halt the contraction for a while. Uh, so the more massive ones, they are deuterium burning at some point, and some of them for longer than others. And this is, of course, going to affect how this works. The last thing I think that is super important is the orbital distance from the star. So there are different formation scenarios uh, for how these wide orbit giants might form. We don't know for sure uh, at all. Uh, so core accretion is how we think that a planet like Jupiter has formed that happens relatively uh, close in at 5 to 10 AU perhaps. Uh, and then the idea is that uh, a planet at 100 AU could have formed in there, but then been scattered out dynamically to where it is currently located. You could also have that uh, a planet at 100 AU has formed in situ, uh, but then the disk that it's formed from will have been a lot more massive. So you will have a very massive disk, and then you'll have gravitational instabilities in the outer parts of this disk. And then you can have that it collapses uh, in a gravitational collapse out there so that it can form where it is. You can also have that earlier on in the star's history, uh, the pre-stellar core fragments into two different clumps that form each their separate object. So this is how a binary star system forms. Maybe it's possible that the same process can occur, but you end up with something that's very massive, the star, and something that's a brown dwarf mass or a planetary mass uh, as the other binary. Uh, so we don't really know, but it's interesting if uh, there is a connection between the formation and the orbital distance that could point towards different formation scenarios if there are different uh, things there. Unfortunately, the planets I have so far, with the exception of Beta Pictoris, uh, they're all very, very far away from the star. We're not going to be able to test this unless we have a lot more planets that are a lot closer in. So if any of you work in direct imaging or with Gaia, uh, please go find me some planets at 5 to 10 AU. That would be great. Uh, so this is just a quick summary slide of the spin because there's a lot of things to keep track of. But I think the important thing is to remember that uh, we are starting to be able to say something about spin rate for different and how that, uh, how that is a function of different uh, parameters. And we're seeing a 
hint of, uh, of this uh, trend here with age. Uh, I'm running out of time, but let's see how we go with this. Uh, so this is just an overview of some of the really important uh, near-infrared high-resolution instruments. The blue ones are the ones that are currently in operation, and also I put cryers in there just so that you can see how it corresponds to the others. Uh, and then the future ones are in green, and I do apologize that uh, I don't have all the optical ones out up here. Uh, I am currently working mainly on near-infrared. Uh, we will definitely also see exciting things come out of Espresso, also in terms of characterization, there is no doubt about that. Uh, but just to give you an idea, so I said that Cryers has a small wavelength range. So you can see this little blue solid part here, that is the, a, an example of a wavelength range that Cryers can do in one go. So yeah, it can do all of these different wavelengths, but it can only do a few of them in one go. Once it gets updated, that will get a lot, uh, a lot broader. We already have spectrographs that are better in terms of wavelength. Uh, iShell uh, at IRTF is a good example, but it's on a much smaller mirror. So the height of these bars is uh, proportional to the mirror size. Uh, you've got also uh, NearSpec, which is a nice spectrograph, but it's only at uh, 20,000 in resolving power. Uh, so that means you do need that extra wavelength range uh, to make up for the fact that you don't have as high spectral resolution. But you can go down to 20,000 and still do high resolution spectroscopy and detect molecules, which is really, really nice. Diano was the example that I showed you that has just been used for the very first time. Uh, ours has not been successfully used yet, but I'm sure that it will. And I can't wait to see what comes out from uh, the hot Jupiter side with Spiru. And then, of course, uh, once we get the next generation of telescopes, you will notice that some of these bars are very, very high. Well, these are, of course, the ones that are going to go on the next generation of telescopes, the extremely large telescopes. Uh, and those are really, really exciting. Uh, so what is it that we want from these very large telescopes? Well, uh, we want orbital inclinations and we want masses, uh, and we're going to want them from non-transiting planets. Also, uh, what will be nice is that instead of needing cross-correlation for, for instance, hot Jupiters, we're going to be able to detect individual lines similar to what I showed you for GQ Lupa B, but better, and also for hot Jupiters, also for uh, super Neptunes. Uh, we're going to be able to much, much better uh, look at the shapes of the lines, both in, if they're individual lines, it would be really easy to look at the shape of them. But if it's a, a weaker planet, a colder planet, we can still look at the shape of the cross correlation function and see how, uh, what can we learn about planet rotation? What can we learn about circulation? What can we learn about the temperature pressure profile that also comes out of the shape of the line? Um, it will also be nice to have a full face curve at high spectral resolution, just like what Laura showed us for low spectral resolution. Um, we want to see how is the temperature pressure profile different on the day side and on the night side of the planet. Uh, we may even be able to determine uh, different uh, isotopes of different molecules, uh, and that will tell us something about the evolution of planet atmospheres. Uh, an example of how this will work, I'm going over time, I can see, <laughs> uh, is here. This is an example uh, of a simulation of optical transmission spectroscopy with an ELT type telescope. So this is the observation that I showed you earlier. This is what a model looks like uh, for the CO day side spectrum of Tau Bodis B. So this was one of the carbon monoxide detection I showed you. And here you have uh, the transmission spectrum of an Earth-sized planet from oxygen around an M5V star. So this is not exactly a sun-like star. Uh, this is like Laura was saying, we're going to be, and Sarah was saying this, uh, we need to be looking at much colder stars. There are more of the smaller stars. They have more planets. And also they're a lot easier to uh, look at because the uh, flux ratio, the contrast between the planet and the star is just a lot better. Uh, so this is something that we will be doing and that we can do. Now let's look at the time scale for this. If we were looking at a, a solar type star, uh, we can do it in maybe a hundred years. Uh, if we're instead looking at something like this, 
it is realistic that we can, in, uh, by observing maybe once a month uh, for four or five years, we can detect oxygen in an Earth-like uh, planet. So that will be worth doing. Um, zero minutes. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to end with, uh, with this slide then. Uh, this is uh, the uh, high dispersion spectroscopy plus high contrast imaging uh, scenario. So what you're looking at here is 1.25 Earth mass planets with Earth-like irradiation, but around different types of stars. Uh, so this is showing you uh, that, again, we have to look at very cold stars in order for this to work. Uh, but it will be doable with ELT-type telescopes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Henrietta. Do we have questions from the audience? We can... People want coffee, but they're not getting coffee till they answer <laughs> ask a question. <laughs> Um, with the spin um, broadening of the lines, can you tell the alignment or the, are, are the spin axis of the planets always aligned with the star or we can you measure know. that? No. We don't know. We would love to be able to say that. If mm -hmm. there's a few cases, for instance, where we can also measure the rotation period from photometric monitoring, mm -hmm. then you can know the inclination. Uh, but else we will have to wait till we've got enough of the orbit that we can start to even say something about the orbit. But that will still not tell us maybe the planet isn't aligned relative to its orbit, and we yeah. won't be able to know that either. So the only thing we can do now is include it in our error bars, and then we can use some statistical arguments about how how the view and geometry should be. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question over here. Your name? Uh, Sarah Ballard, thanks for a great talk, uh, Henriette. I had a question about um, the unique identification of molecules in future transmission spectra. So I know it's something that folks have been thinking a lot about ahead of time, which is let's say you have this ideal transmission spectrum and it has a very high signal to noise, let's say from, from JWST. There's still some degeneracy of identification yeah. of different lines. Um, is it your opinion that high dispersion spectroscopy is really the only way to uniquely identify molecules? Or do you think it's like, if you had a, a transmission spectrum from James Webb, would you require um, high dispersion ground-based spectroscopy to confirm? What do you think? I think in the beginning, we're going to need high dispersion spectroscopy because there's still so many uncertainties when it comes to modeling. There's still too many unknowns uh, about the chemistry, about how these things work, or even the Though the theory people are very, very good, they don't, they can't predict what's going to happen. Uh, so I think that to begin with, it will be very useful to have, okay, so James Webb is saying these are the molecules that are present, and then we've got high dispersion spectroscopy saying, yes, that's correct, great, okay, now we can make those models better. And I think seeing that game go, how that goes together is going to be super, super useful, even if we don't do the joint analysis, just by confirming each other. Uh, this is Laura Kreidberg. Thanks, Henry, for a great talk. Um, I, following on to that question, I was wondering if you have any comment on using high dispersion spectroscopy to detect more exotic molecules. One of the challenges with the low dispersion stuff is that if you're looking in a water band, all you're going to see is water, right? Um, yes. And so maybe there are other things that you could see. Uh, yeah, so... Um I think we still need to do a lot of work when it comes to uh, simulating uh, how more complex molecules, what, what's going to happen once we start looking at colder atmospheres. Colder atmospheres are much more complex and we're going to see these complex molecules. Uh, and what makes this work so well as it is, is because carbon monoxide, for instance, has these nice lines and we know exactly where they are. What's going to help us a little bit is that line positions are better known once you go to colder temperatures. So at least we don't have to worry about someone making an experiment at 2,500 degrees in their lab, uh, which they tend to say no to for some reason. Uh, so, so it helps that we can at least know the line positions really well. Uh, but this, it will be a lot more complex because also you will have a lot more blended lines. You won't have one molecule that's dominating with nice, strong, uh, well-separated lines. So you're going to need the full atmosphere and at what point does it start to make more sense to do a, a more uh, standard approach of retrieval rather than cross-correlation? When is one an advantage? I don't think we've answered that question yet. Okay, any other questions from the audience or do you want to have coffee <laughs> and cake? Maybe is there cake? 
Yeah, we have one more. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Stéphane Udry. Uh, you mentioned Jano and with a very good word, but uh, for me it's not the best of the infrared spectrograph already on the market. Uh, it's Carmen S, for example. Have you tried to use Carmen S? Not for yet, but wouldn't I love to? Uh, I, I think that we're going to see great things from Carmen S. It's still relatively new. Uh, I don't currently have access to it, um, but there's no doubt. I know there are people working on it, and it will happen. Yeah, without saying any secret, uh, the, the, the helium, yeah. helium yeah. line that we saw from HST yeah. is detected at the level of uh, a signal to another 15 with a four-meter telescope from the ground with, yeah. with carbon S. So, yeah. it's, uh, there, there's, there's no doubt. I mean, if we go back to this slide here, uh, you can do amazing things with this. Of course, you can also do amazing things when you've got this. Look at it. I mean... That's awesome. Yeah, stability of the <laughs> instrument is a key aspect. Very That's true. probably where we gain. Yeah. On top of resolution. Okay, uh, I don't see any more hands, so we will take a break for coffee and we are back, I think, at 3.30 for the panel discussion then with Sophia. Okay, see you then. Thank you. <laughs>